Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop from Washington. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress right here in Washington, D.C. I was reading uh, over the weekend a book by an author that I actually hope to have on my show uh, soon. Uh, his name is Dan Pfeiffer, and he is, or was, I should say, uh, the former communications guy for Barack Obama, kind of that all-purpose staffer that comes from the campaign, joins the administration, becomes a senior policy advisor. I think he served him for six years from 08 to 2014. And as I was reading the book, just two words came to mind. Thanks, Obama. No, really, thanks, Obama. It's hard to believe that two years ago, we had a functioning president, a sane, stable, kind-hearted, hardworking, intelligent man as president. Can you even remember back that far? President Barack Obama was, well, he's a very good president, but he was also a very normal president. He thought about what he had to say before he said it. And yeah, he could roll with the punches and yeah, he could, he could, um, he was willing to take some risks, but never for a moment did he sacrifice national security or look at the White House as a way to grift, to line his pockets. Um, in fact, I defy you to remember scandals from the Obama years. What were they? Well, I mean, there was, I mean, there was that time he, uh, well, you know, when the Russians, uh, it's hard to think of them. Oh yeah, there was the tan suit. You remember that, right? He wore a tan suit. Oh, he was crucified for that. I mean, Obama made mistakes. I criticized him. One time I even had an Obama intervention because I felt he was giving in too much to the Republicans. But these mistakes or critiques were normal policy mistakes. Never once did I doubt his integrity. Never once did I doubt his love of country. Never once did I doubt that he was trying to do things that would make the lives of ordinary Americans better. He and I might disagree on time to time on the way to accomplish those things, on the tactics to achieve these overall goals, but it was a sane, stable presidency. And as I was reading the book, I was thinking to myself, you know, you remember that time when all those leaks occurred and Obama staffer was attacking Obama staffer and, yeah, I don't remember that either. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. There were virtually no leaks. In fact, I would say there were fewer leaks in the Obama White House than in the Bush White House or the Clinton White House. Well, not to mention what's happening here. They say a fish rots from the head on down. I don't know if that's true. I tend to cook my fish before they rot. But it's certainly true that in this White House, Trump and Trumpism is infecting everything they do. It's not just the orange monster at the top. I, I wish it were. But frankly, anyone with so few moral values that they're willing to work for this incompetent, narcissistic, corrupt, traitorous nightmare probably is a little bit of a grifter themselves. Probably they're looking to profit in their own way. And so we see Scott Pruitt padding his pockets and Tom Price padding his pockets and um, uh, ben Carson and Betsy DeVos. And it seems like every member of the Trump administration is looking for ways to use the American people to con us into getting rich in some way. And well, when they're all a den of thieves, of course they're attacking each other. In the Obama era, staffers were actually trying to achieve goals, trying to make lives better off, whether it was healthcare or criminal justice reform, or frankly, just inspiring us to be better versions of ourselves. Now, I know this sounds cliche. I know we live in a post-Trump universe. Frankly, the skepticism and the cynicism predates Donald Trump. In fact, a lot of it began in the Obama era. 
and a lot of it stems from Fox News. Now, I've been on Fox News personally hundreds of times. If you want to watch me on Fox News, just go to marklevingtalk.com and you can watch me battle Bill O'Reilly or Laura Ingram or Sean Hannity or any of them. And was I treated fairly on Fox? Of course not. Their job is not to treat people fairly. Their job is, well, in the Obama era, to take him down. Truth doesn't matter. They can just make up stuff at will. Indeed, they largely created the fake news that we have all over the internet. You know, the Russians didn't make this up. They copied it from Fox News. And Fox News didn't invent it either. Nazi propagandist Josef Goebbels writes about the big lie, the way that if you create a really big lie, you can convince tens of millions of people to believe it. It seems counterintuitive, but Goebbels writes, the Nazi propagandist writes, if you tell a small lie, people catch you on it, right? Lie about your age, lie about um, uh, remembering your spouse's anniversary, <laughs> lie about uh, telling someone that they look nice when something on your face suggests that you're just being nice. All those small lies are easily caught. And the reason they're easily caught is because we all do them. These are human, I almost hate to use the word white here, but little white lies, right? These are, I mean, we all, you know, uh, you know, sorry I was late, I was caught in traffic. Well, or maybe you just didn't get out of the house in time. But we all do these little lies. And some, a lot of times people realize their lies and they really don't matter because they're small. And so those lies are often actually caught. But big, monstrous lies. There's a secret plot in the deep state. And they're trying to put demons in your head with, uh, that's why you have to wear the tinfoil hat. Or the Jews are in control of the media. We have to stop them. Or the blacks are all violent. And well, I don't have to tell you all the racist and anti-Semitic and misogynist lies that people put out because you know them because the Trump era spreads them. Well, the Nazis did this and they did them quite well. What they would do is spread a bunch of lies. And so people who in Germany who were truly suffering after World War I, it was a devastating war for Germany. They signed, they surrendered, they signed the Treaty of Versailles, which was very hard on Germany, hyperinflation and punishing measures. But rather than blame France, it was much easier to blame an internal enemy trying to take, take them all down. The communists, the Soviet government, also used lies. Way back in the 1920s, Vladimir Ilyich Ulanov, otherwise known as Lenin, Lenin talked about useful idiots. Who were the useful idiots? The useful idiots were the people dumb enough to believe Lenin's lies. But they were useful. They were idiotic, sure, but they were useful. Today, a third of America, maybe as high as 40%, I hope not. Let's say 35% of America is Trump's useful idiots. Now, I know a bunch of people get mad at me. Mark, you're calling all these Americans idiots, you elitist, blah, blah. If you believe, well, as Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani said, truth isn't true, <laughs> you're an idiot. Now, I realize that's not nice to say. But when you believe Donald Trump when he says black, and then he believe, you believe the same thing when he says white, when you hear him say something is true and then it isn't true, and he didn't help his son with the excuses about the Russian uh, meeting, and then he did dictate it, and then he just changes his story 12 times, and you believe it all 12 times, well, you're not using the logical part of your brain. You're using the amygdala. You're using the emotional part. But sometimes those of us who believe in reason, who believe in logic, we, the elite, people who actually believe that logic is correct, that A equals A, and that truth is true. Truth is actually true. There are no alternative facts. There are things that are true, and there are things that are not true, 
and there are things that we don't know whether they're true or not. But truth is true. And those of us who insist that remind me of, well, Winston in George Orwell's novel of 1984. Did you read that? If not, it's a great time to get that book. It's a quick read. Winston, who didn't love Big Brother, did not love the authoritarian dictator who told him that war is peace and freedom is slavery and ignorance is strength. And he was basically tortured until he at least said that he loved Big Brother. It's one thing to have a debate on whether or not um, we should provide for poor people, uh, allow babies to live, uh, you know, or, or cut off health care to people or, or uh, take care of immigrants. We can argue those things. But when a dictator tells you two plus two equals five and you know it's not true, but you say it anyway, well, that's Trumpism. That's what they do on Fox News. I happen to know I've met those people behind the scenes. Virtually no one in Congress actually believes the empty and contradictory rhetoric of Trumpism, but they spout it. And the reasons why they spout it stem back to the Obama years and beyond. And I wanna to examine today how lessons from those years can help us defeat Trumpism in the future. Stay tuned. If you want to call in, it's 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. We'll be right back right after this. Hiring is the most challenging part of my job. It's really Sounds hard. good, Mark. The searching, All right. The sorting through um, have you guys been doing any kind of uh, Google chat or anything, or is the caller info just relayed to you through the mic here? Oh, no, we do it on the Gmail. Okay, okay, let me get that up for us. Uh, I've been using, I have, um, I've got uh, Mark Romaldi's, but if you have some other name, I can just go to you. Yeah, or I could go to you because I think I have you saved on my contacts. Okay. So yeah, I'll we'll do use that. Gmail chat. Okay, sounds good. I had the person we needed within one week. I don't know we how we used to use AOL instant, instant message. Whether you're looking so yes, I do remember so those old. fond days. <laughs> I have Steve Trippy and I have Mark Romali. I don't have you. That's okay. Let me uh, let me get it pulled up. Okay. ZipRecruiter, the fastest way to hire. And right now you can try ZipRecruiter. So hello, Facebook free. audience. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash radio offer. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash radio offer. ZipRecruiter.com slash radio offer. audio stream offer. sent to progressive voices ain't IRA, working. Oh, that's bad. 401k. Then I hope hey, Mike, is it working 30, now? 40, 50% or more of your retirement savings. Because it's not a question of if the market crashes again. It's a question of when. It's going to happen. Did you know there is a way you can protect and grow your wealth safely and predictably every single year? The people using this approach didn't lose a penny when the market crashed in 2000 or 2008, and they won't lose a penny in the next crash. I sent it to That's Mark at MarkLevineTalk.com. Yep, hold on. In and okay. Out, even when stocks, real estate, and uh, other investments there you are. tumble. A free report detailing this savings program is now available. This free report shows how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and wealth-building power without risking your retirement in the Wall Street casino. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement. It far outperforms any IRA or 401k. To get this free report, visit bankonyourself.com. That's bankonyourself.com. Bankonyourself.com. You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network. And here's a clip from Tara Buster with Tara. So let's go ahead and cut off the uh, the feed, actually. You that your problems are, so it won't, won't go through the Facebook folks. Andrew? Yes, sir. Just cut off the feed uh, when, I, when commercial Sucker. break, all right? But I don't care. Oh, okay. Thanks. Just so my Facebook listeners don't really need to hear. Uh, yep. Been a minute since I've done it, so I'm getting back into the swing of it here. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Just when we get back in, just start the music. You got it. Yeah, and also, um, when it's time to go out, just play the music 30 seconds before. No need to tell me or anything. Yes, I remember that. Okay. That sounds good. All right.
we'll be back shortly, folks. Ready, Mark? Ready. Okay. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. What lessons can we learn from the Obama era? What can they teach us in the Trump era? One of the things I think they teach us is that a story is better than a complex plan. Now, when you're governing, when you are trying to write laws, and you know I've written a few of them as a delegate to the Virginia State Legislature, it's important to get the details right. I'm not knocking details. I'm not knocking nerds. It's very important where that comma is, and if you've got a 12-part plan, it better be working, and all 12 parts must fix together, and you got to work that out as a legislator behind the scenes, but you don't campaign on it. People don't want to hear your 12-point plan. They kind of want to know that you have it, maybe, maybe, but rarely do they go into the details. In fact, unfortunately, the lobbyists probably go into the details more than your ordinary uh, citizen. Nope, you got to tell a story. You got to appeal to someone's heart. I think one of the reasons why Barack Obama beat Hillary Clinton in 2008 was because that's exactly what he did. I mean, the policy differences between them were minuscule. In fact, on the one main thing that they, you probably don't remember this, or maybe you do, but the main thing that they disagreed on in 2008 was that Hillary Clinton said that you had to have a penalty for people who didn't enjoy the health care exchanges so that people were incentivized to join so that healthy people would join, and then when they became sick, could use the plan. Obama said that penalty wasn't necessary. That was actually the politically right answer. It was actually the technically the wrong answer. And Obama learned soon after coming to office that Hillary Clinton was right all along, and he put in the, um, that, that penalty that actually kept all health care costs down for uh, the years he was in office. Lowest rate of healthcare increase in post-World War American history. It's now skyrocketing again because, well, Trump took that out. But the point is the policy difference between them were minuscule. Where they differed was in tone, in energy, in storytelling. Barack Obama had a great story. He had a great life history, a great story. Hillary Clinton actually had a good story too, if you knew it. But how often did you know it? How often did you know her background? How often did you know the fights that she did when she was young? For Hillary Clinton, she was Bill Clinton's wife. She was the spurned spouse in the Lewinsky affair. She was the Machiavellian behind the uh, uh, 1994 attempt to, to make health care better. Now, I'd worked with Hillary Clinton. I'd worked with her one-on-one. I worked as a staffer. I was actually the lead counsel for Congressman Barney Frank, and I worked one-on-one -on -one sitting across negotiating with Hillary Clinton. I knew she was brilliant. I knew that she grasped the details better than most other politicians I had met, and I knew she had a lot of heart. That didn't come across in her campaign. Obama showed his heart. Hillary Clinton did not. And again, it's not at all detracting from Hillary Clinton's competence. Hillary Clinton would have made an incredibly good president. But to become president in a democracy, you got to go through the voters first. And one of the things we've learned about the Obama era that translates into the Trump era is that emotions matter. Stories matter. Heck, at least Obama's stories were true. What Trump has taught us is that even fake stories matter. And we'll get to those after the break. 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. Back right after this. Not available in California. Um, Andrew, a number of people are writing in the uh, Facebook message that Progressive Voices app is not working. And it's yes, not that is. One, it's not just one person saying so. Yep, uh, and that is correct. And uh, Mark Romaldi is on it. He's okay. been speaking with their engineer. Um, apparently, it's a connection down on their end. So Ugh. not much I can do here in the studio, unfortunately. For All right, it. as long as you knew about it and, and they're working on it. that's. Uh... Yeah, um, I was aware of it before the show. We tried to establish connection. Um, I was on the phone with Mark, and he uh, reached out to their engineer. 
Um, so right. I guess they're trying to reboot some machines on their end. Okay. Well, keep um, it, and we'll give them the archive and ask them to, to play the archive uh, later on. But, yep. Uh, that's that's unfortunate, but life goes on. The show goes on. Yes, absolutely. All right. I'll keep you posted if uh, I learn of anything yeah, just, just more on the center if I know. hear from Mark. Okay. So, so thank you, Facebook listeners, for um, letting me know it is a problem. And as you heard, we are working on it. Hey, what can I say? Technology ain't perfect. It's one of the reasons why I do these Facebook things, so that people who have trouble on the radio – can hear me uh, live this way. Sorry about that. By the way, for anyone who wants to get just the audio of my feed, uh, maybe um, uh, I know uh, there's some radio stations that use it, but maybe you want to just share the audio, go to my website, marklevinetalk.com. Facebook Live obviously gives you the video. Hello. But uh, the sound quality is probably better, particularly if like all my podcasts come from marklevinetalk.com. Those are the ones that are saved to iTunes and the ones that are saved to, um, like if you want to find any of my past, I think they saved 30 or 50 shows. You go to the iTunes store and the podcast. Those all come from the audio from my website. So um, anytime you can't get me on Facebook, you can't get me on radio, you can't get me on the Progressive Voices app, you can always get me on my website, marklevinetalk.com, M-A-R-K-L-E-V-I-N-E-T-A-L-K.com. And honestly, it's good to get the podcasts. You know, there's 50 of them or so on, on iTunes and Apple. But if you go to my, um, my website, you can do a search for, I've done more than 2,500 radio shows. 2,500. Woo! Some were three hours long. Um, I don't even want to do the math about how much time that is out of my life I've spent on radio. The point is, is that I've dealt with virtually every topic under the sun, from abortion to Zimbabwe and everything in between. So um, use that search engine. The really old shows, I've been on the air 15 years now, the really old shows, like the first five years, some of those I used a different archiving system and you won't be able to get them from the website. But if you email me, um, I have them and I can pull them up. But pretty much the last eight to 10 years, they're all there. And um, you might find an interesting show uh, way back when like the 2008 show where I had a really, really tough decision by the endorsed Obama over Hillary um, and spent 55 minutes complaining that I had to make a choice <laughs> because I liked them both a lot. And then um, my final choice in the last five minutes of the show and why I made it. But again, there's a wealth of activity. I, I just noticed, by the way, from a really early show in 04, 05, I didn't even remember this. I actually interviewed Alex Jones. I know, I know, I'm still feel a little dirty. I'd forgotten that I'd done that. Um, and someone mentioned to me, I'm like, I interviewed Alex Jones and I just typed it in the uh, archive and bingo, <gasps> I did. I interviewed him. He claimed at the time that 9-11 was an inside job, that Bush and Cheney and all of them had planted bombs in the World Trade Center. And I interviewed him, I gave him a tough interview. And from the comments, it's clear that I didn't believe him. <laughs> he hadn't persuaded me. Um, but, um, yeah, fake news goes back a long way. It's just in those days, well, he wasn't treated seriously. and shouldn't be. Let me know when you're ready, sir. I'm ready. Okay, here you go. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. What are the lessons of Obama's years, and what can they teach us about Trumpism? One of the things they teach us is that, well, there's an old saying. You've probably heard it. If you can't beat them, join them, Right. You try to beat your opponent and it doesn't work. So you join with them to do something. You make some agreement. Well, the Obama years taught us if you can't join them, beat them. The implacable Republican Party really started back in the mid 90s with Newt Gingrich, who would give these big speeches to empty chambers of the House of Representatives. Now, they never turned the camera around. So people thought he was giving a speech to a whole bunch of people, but well, for someone who worked in the house, I can tell you there might be three, four people in the room. <laughs> he was giving a big speech to an empty theater. But one of the things that Newt Gingrich taught us, again, way back in the 90s, is that perception matters more than reality. That what you think is true is more important than what is actually true. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody knows and no one reports it and no one sees it, then as far as Republicans are concerned, it just didn't fall. It doesn't matter that it actually did fall. That's a question of truth. In science, they don't give a damn about truth. The question is perception. 
if you can convince a bunch of really, really ignorant Americans, Americans who are so susceptible to being lied to that they would basically drink Jim Jones Kool-Aid, I'm sure, and have it kill them all. If you can persuade these Americans whose racism and hatred of their fellow man is stronger, or shall I say trumps, any reasonable, logical working of the uh, brain, you can persuade them that Barack Obama was born in Kenya, that he's not legitimate president because the Hawaiian birth certificate is wrong and the birth announcement is wrong. And somehow evil forces conspired to get this baby from Kenya secretly into America because they knew that one day, 50 years later, he would become president. And because they knew like Simba would become king in The Lion King or one of those Shakespeare plays, they knew the boy would become king. Uh, they decided to sneak him in because there weren't any real American blacks that could, uh, you know, I, to even try to explain the birtherism, to even try to make it logical. It's idiotic. How can you believe two plus two equals five? Well, you believe it if you're like, well, I'm a white guy and I hate black people and two plus two equals five is my way to stop on black people. Or if you're someone who trucks in that racism and you're like, well, I know Obama was born in Hawaii, but um, hey, I can get a lot of press if I just tell this ridiculous lie. Well, again, Newt Gingrich taught us it doesn't matter if anyone's listening to your speech. It doesn't matter if it's true. If you can convince your idiotic base to believe it, that's fine. Again, predates Newt Gingrich. Lenin taught it. And Hitler taught it too. So he had some great role models. But this continued into the, the Obama era. You now have an entire news station devoted to fake news. The entire purpose of Fox News, developed by Nixon strategist Roger Ailes, may he rest in no peace, may he be tortured in hell. The reason why this whole thing developed is, again, right out of the Hitler playbook, right out of the Lenin playbook, if you convince enough people, people who want to hate, people who are primed to hate, people who are losers and have difficult lives and don't want to blame the fact that, oh, well, they didn't work hard enough, or they were dealt a raw deal, or their father abused them, or they fell asleep in school, or they had a terrible health emergency, whatever it is, people suffer for all kinds of reasons. And sometimes it's their fault, and maybe more often than not, it's not their fault but they wanted someone to blame. And if you can give them this vast lie to have them blame, well, again, started in the 90s, Newt Gingrich taught us that that could be true. And so when Barack Obama became president, the country split into two. And it re had really nothing to do with Barack Obama. It had nothing to do with the man named Barack Hussein Obama and that middle name sure got him in a lot of trouble. Obama hatred had nothing to do with Obama. Obama hatred had to do with the fact that an African-American man, frankly, half white guy, half white and half African man, not even a descendant of slaves, but this half Kansan white American and half African man was becoming the most powerful leader in the world. And for some of us, that brought us to happy tears. Right, I can still go back and see in Chicago in 2008, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people crowded in. Oprah's there, right? She's crying. Everyone has tears in their eyes. For most of us, for me, for I think everyone listening to my voice right now, that was such a moving day, such a beautiful day. It, we believed anything could happen. Yes, we can, right? If an intelligent, accomplished black man could become president of the United States, then maybe, maybe barriers would fall. Maybe, just maybe, racism was dying. Maybe there was a future for all of us, future for women, future for the rainbow community, gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual people, a future for people who are disabled or people who um, grew up poor or homeless. 
half the country saw it the another way. They saw it as the death of white privilege. They didn't put it that way in their mind, right? People who have the most white privilege rarely notice the white privilege. But they saw it as the death of their control. Right? Laura Ingram famously talks about demographic changes so that the brown people are coming in and they're going to take over. And let's face it, America is going to be majority non-white in about 20 years. And if your concept of America is we're all about constitutional ideas and freedom and democracy and equality for all and looking out for one another and free speech and free press and free religion, then the color of the skin is irrelevant. Uh, great. If we're about immigrants and people from all over the planet, great. We have all these people from all over the world that are making America even better with all these new ideas. And But if you see America not as an idea the way I do, but as a white, European, Anglo, racist, apartheid state, which, let's face it, we have been much of our century. That image of America is not wrong. It's not wrong to think of America as a white, privileged, apartheid state. You know, we had slavery for a couple hundred years, and then we still didn't allow blacks to vote for another hundred years after that. And there's still lots of racism today. Don't be upset at the white supremacists seeing America as a racist state. That's the one thing they're right about. Where they're wrong is if that should be us. We've always had these tensions in our history, right? The Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, written by a man who owns slaves. Right? Our ideals have always been in conflict with our reality. And liberals today talk about America's ideals. Barack Obama was the hope and embodiment of our ideals. Trumpism is the despair and pessimism of our dark reality, of America at its worst, of America the hate, America the enslaver, America the genocider, the country that committed genocide against the Native Americans here, the country that said no Irish need apply, the country that said that women can't have those jobs, the country that taught things that led to the crucifixion of Matthew Shepard, the country that lynched thousands of innocent black men and women. We've always been both. We've always been both. So Trumpism has an, a natural antecedent in our history. And just because it's not based on logic, right? Birtherism is ridiculous almost as ridiculous as the idea that Hillary Clinton is running a child porn something or other in the base, non-existent basement of a DC pizza parlor. It, that view is illogical, but it has a solid basis in American history. And what's fascinating about it is that the haters, while the haters gonna hate, 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 sorry Taylor Swift, the haters are gonna hate, but they're not gonna admit they're hating. I always find it amazing when Donald Trump resists the label racist. It's who he is, he's what he's about. You know what, even the neo-Nazis who marched in Charlottesville resist the label racist. <laughs> the definition of racist. And that's progress. The Ku Klux Klan wouldn't have dismissed the title racist. The fact that it's not polite to be racist anymore doesn't change the fact that there are a lot of racists around, but it's a start. What Obama era taught us, and it really wasn't Obama, it was the Obama era, is that you can't work with these people. Obama would try again and again and again to appeal to Republicans. He would go to them. He would ask them to lunch. He would go to their to the Capitol. He would say, meet with me, talk with me, discuss with me. And they were like, nope, you're a black man. Okay, they didn't say it quite like that, but they meant it. They wouldn't meet with him because when they met with him, their own racist supporters would be angry at them. You want to know why Republicans are so mad at the Republican establishment? 
because Republican establishment largely believes in working with the Democratic establishment to make America better off. And that includes black people. That includes women. That includes Latinos. That includes gay and lesbian people. That includes all of us. And if you believe that America is by the white man, for the white man, of the white man, and to be specific, of the English white male Protestant who owns property and dates back to the Mayflower. Well, you're not going to be very happy with those choices. What started in the Obama era, this evil root blossomed into this fetid stinkwad in the Trump years. But it was always beneath the surface. And what this book reminds me is that this is not a new issue in American history. Hatred, racism is not new. Even fake news is not new. I talked about how it had been used by Lenin, how it was used by Hitler. But you don't have to go across an ocean. It was used by Joe McCarthy right here in the good old USA, right in the Midwest. Joe McCarthy was from Wisconsin, land of nice people, right? Honest Midwestern values, right? I, I like Midwesterners. Joe McCarthy predated all of this. I actually, I've done a lot of research on Joe McCarthy. I find it a fascinating time in American history. Joe McCarthy was running for reelection as the junior senator from Wisconsin in 1950. He'd won a race, it was close. He was afraid he's gonna have a close race running for senator again, he's looking for an issue. And his group decided, hey, we got an issue. We're gonna expand the St. Lawrence Seaway. We're gonna widen uh, the area where the Great Lakes meet Wisconsin so we can dredge that little place so ships can come in and better shipping. And they agreed that was the topic, boring but helpful to people of Wisconsin. And then they all went out that night to drink. Because Joe McCarthy liked to drink. And that night, late in the night, as they're all drunk off their rear ends, one of his staffers, we don't know who, says, you know, you know it would be funny. We should just claim that there's a bunch of communists in the U.S. government. That would get people really angry. That would get us reelected. They all laughed. He didn't really change the idea. It's going to be on the St. Lawrence Seaway. But the next day, bleary-eyed after his drunken night the night before, Joe McCarthy, Senator Joe McCarthy of Wisconsin, was changing planes in West Virginia because in those days, you couldn't get across the country. The plane had to refuel. Refueling stop in West Virginia takes out a laundry list, literally a laundry list, right? Dry cleaning, two pair of pants, four shirts. And says, I have here in my hands a list of 47 communists in the U.S. government. Now, he never said their names. He never showed anyone the list. No one seemed to question how Joe McCarthy, this backbencher senator from Wisconsin, was given a list of spies in the U.S. government. Who gave him the list? Why would they do that? Why would they choose him? How did he find out? Basic logical questions. No. It was an exciting story. Spies, communists in the U.S. government. Who cares about the truth of it? Who cares about getting to the bottom of it? It sells newspapers. That's how McCarthyism began. Trumpism is nothing new. But we need to recognize where it came from. And we need to recognize that its seeds began in the Obama years and why. Going to get to your calls right after the break. 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. Right back after this. Very few people know about the origin of McCarthyism. I, I actually, uh, it's a research project I did in high school. And I read that and I was like, whoa, began as a joke. He was just trying to 
he knew that his age would read the newspapers and he was it was he was punking them but boy did it work boy did he set off a firestorm that would get him roaring to re-election all on the basis of fake news Oh, and of course, the mastermind behind Joe McCarthy was his lawyer, Roy Cohn, who happened to be the mentor of Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a direct descendant of McCarthyism. You can't make this stuff up. Just looked it up. It was 205 communists he falsely claimed he had a list of. And uh, no one ever saw that list. Hey, and if you're enjoying the show, particularly today when Progressive Voices app is down, please spread the word. Excuse me. God bless you. Bless you again. Thank you. Hey, even my sneeze is on Facebook. That's pretty authentic, right? See, I'm a real person. I have a real cold. Uh, no, but seriously, spread the word. Uh, let people know about it. Um, spread this Facebook post. Normally, we would spread progressive voices, but since it's not on today, um, this is the only record of the show, so let people know what we're doing. Oh, special show tomorrow. Don't miss. Special show tomorrow. Uh, got uh, Senator Amanda Chase, my uh, uh, Republican counterpart in the Virginia General Assembly. And um, www.agrandalliance.org. Ready, Mark? Ready. Okay. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Got time for a couple calls. Let's start with a uh, oh, couple of uh, a common, uh, frequent callers. Uh, Reggie in Georgia, line three, it looks like. Hey, Reggie, how are you? And happy Monday to you too, Mark. Happy uh, Monday. Uh, the, well, the best way to stand up to them, I mean, the best way to defeat them is to you know, stand up to them, don't be bullied, intimidated, afraid or scared by them. Don't run away with the, with your tails in between your legs, you know? I and, could uh, agree with you more. I, I, the reason I ran for office, frankly, it's a complaint I've had for 15 years, is that I felt that we had too many namby-pamby Democrats. I do not like them. I, I, I actually... For all my love of President Obama, I had an Obama intervention in 2010 or 2011 when he was caving to, uh, maybe it was 2011, when he was caving to various Republican plans. And I said, no, stand firm, stand with your values. Uh, Democrats do best when we fight for our values. We can't join them. They won't let us join them. Obama tried really, really hard to join them, to work with them. They refused everything. And if you, if you can't join them, beat them. We have the majority. The majority of Americans support us, but when we go around like, oh, well, you know, I guess we'll, we'll give up our values, 
Mm, that's how we lose elections. So I, I agree with you, Reggie. Absolutely. Hey, one more thing, Reggie. Still there? Yeah. Did you register to vote? Go to rocktovote.org. All right. Will you do that for me today? Right. Rocktovote.org. Check it out and you can register right there. All right, man. Okay. Thanks, Reggie. I appreciate it. Let's go to Michael from the Bronx, Old Faithful, line four. Hey, Michael. Hey, hey. What's up, Mark? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, you're good. You're on the air. Go for it. Oh, all right. The thing is that one thing we can learn is um, for one thing you mentioned about truth, all right? And Obama certainly knows how to speak truth, but um, Trump does it. And then to tie that in, when you have the passage of a couple of individuals, um, Obama speaks truth and focuses on the deceased, and Trump will make up stuff and focus on himself. So, and, right. And so here's the thing. Only. I think President Obama, um, like well, all presidents, um, knows the difference. Well, can I give an example? Sure. Go ahead. The recent passing of the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, mm -hmm. he couldn't, Trump couldn't just leave it at that when he said that she had a very heavenly voice or something like that. I thought it was admirable, although I would question the sincerity. But then he goes further in making up a falsehood, saying that Franklin using, um, used to work. Now, that was according to New York Post, so either... Well, wait, wait, wait. I, I didn't hear this. I, I, I missed some of Trump's yeah. lies. What did he say about Aretha Franklin, the Queen He of Soul? said Aretha Franklin, according to New York Post, Aretha Franklin used to work for him. Now, for Donald Trump? What? <laughs> yep, yep. Now, here's the thing. And here's my bottom line. Oh, my this God. So oh, bad. my God. Either he made that statement about Aretha Franklin or I, I, New York Post fabricated well I, I i don't care i don't, I don't care the part the part the point is so here's what i was about to say the difference between barack obama and donald trump is a golf but obama like like most presidents knows the truth tries to tried to spin it his way but basically let people know the truth um you know richard nixon knew the difference between truth and lies and purposely chose to to, to tell us lies donald trump i honestly believe has no concept of truth or falsity donald trump says whatever he thinks helps donald trump and he might that means he might tell the truth sometimes sometimes in fact he blurts out the truth like the fact that he fired comey because of the russia investigation uh even though it happens to be true so he has no concept of truth or falseness donald trump will say whatever comes out of his mind is helping donald trump it's kind of the same thing a one or a two-year-old does most of us grow out of it Thank you, everyone, for your call today. Tune in tomorrow for a very special show, a debate with Republican Virginia Sandra. Right back tomorrow on Inside Scoop. Hiring is the most challenging.